I would like to introduce not Mr. Dan Siegel or Dr. Dan Siegel, but Mui Dan Siegel, the most <laughs> flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable person. But what we're going to do is talk about the mind. So let's begin with the question, how many of you would say that you have a mind? Let's, let's start with that. So raise your hand. OK, great. So that's most people. Uh, excellent. Um, now, maybe some of you are not raising your hand because, as you probably know, that word actually doesn't have a shared definition. And in fact, it usually doesn't have any definition. So that's probably very appropriate to say, why would I raise my hand and say I have one when I don't know what it is? So that's reasonable. <coughs> so we're going to go through the journalist. <laughs> excuse me, let me just grab a water, which I prepared for myself right over here. Uh, so we're going to go through the journalist's interrogatives that you may have learned in high school English. Uh, do you remember what those are? Who, what, where, when, why, and how. There are six of them. And um, which one should I drink? Uh, so there are six interrogatives, and I'm going to give you a choice of which ones we do in which order. And they're all going to be about the mind. So for example, we might ask, who are we in terms of what our mind is? Or how does the mind work? Or what is the mind? Or get really weird and say, when is the mind? Or where is the mind? That's, in fact, our hashtag for the conversation we're going to all invite you to do. Uh, the, where, are the, where are our Norton team? Um, where's the Norton team? So the, our wonderful Norton folks are here. And you know we have now. Uh, over 50 textbooks in the series. Deborah Malmud, where are you, Deborah? Uh, Deborah had asked me years ago, after I wrote a book called The Developing Mind, to think about doing a series with her. And we met together. And it seemed like it would be so much fun that we decided to do it. And we made it a series on interpersonal neurobiology, which is a word meaning what would happen if you combined all the fields of science, math, physics, chemistry, biology, psychology, linguistics, sociology, anthropology, put them all together into one framework. What would that be like? And that's called interpersonal neurobiology. And we thought, what if we made a series where we applied that synthetic view of science into one framework and looked at the practical applications of it for the field of mental health? So this book, Mind, which I'll talk about tonight, is book number 51 in the series. So other people are many of the authors. I've written a few books in that series. But it's other authors in this field who've contributed to the growth of this field in the, in the world of mental health. This talk will be specifically about mind. And we're going to look at things like, where is the mind? And our hashtag for this is, where is your mind? So that would be one we can look at. Uh, and we can also look at these deeper questions about ethics and how to live. And it's always good to think about this at a time of whether you're thinking about your own life, thinking about people in your family, your friends, or maybe even thinking about people you might choose to vote for or not. Um, so the election becomes very relevant when it comes to thinking about what the mind is and what the mind of the voter is, or for example, what the mind of a given president might be like. So these are just important questions in making big public decisions. So let's start with you. Um, we've, most of us say we have a mind. Which one do you want to start with of the six interrogatives? Anyone have a, a feeling inside of their body? Uh, where? Wow, you want to go with the hashtag, where is your mind? OK. Norton folks must be very happy, because we, we, we tried to figure out if we're going to make a public conversation, which is what basically this book is about, how to have, bless you. Let's have a bless you for everyone's going to sneeze, by the way. You ready? Bless you. So um, if we're going to have a conversation about this in our larger culture, we thought, how would you do this, for example, through social media? So we want to start with where. That's great. So let's look at that. Where? is your mind. So now you're sitting right there. Now, Anne, what do you, do you call these pews? Or what do you call them? Benches? Benches. Benches. OK, benches. <laughs> I want to get the proper language down. 
<laughs> so I would love to know where my grandmother used to sit on the benches here. Um, are these the same benches from back then? The same benches. Wow. Can you imagine that? Minnie sat here somewhere. Um, maybe some of you may feel her when she's, she's um, giving her mind there. But where is your mind? As you're sitting there, of course, I shouldn't say of course because that's never a good thing to say, but you have a body that, that you brought to ethical culture tonight. You brought a body. So that's an accepted thing. You have a body. You are sitting, most people are sitting, yeah, sitting in a bench in ethical culture. So you have a body. So when you ask the question about the mind, what is the connection between the mind and your body? Is your mind in your body? What's that? So there's so the statement is um, there's an integration between the mind and the body. So there's some connection between your body and your mind. We haven't said you wanted to start with where. I didn't choose that. You started with that. Um, so it's hard to say where is your mind when you haven't said what is the mind, right? So you can see how if you write a book about this, like I just did, you know, you want to think, okay, how would the reader take this in? So I didn't start with where, by the way. That was long into the book because I start with the what, because if you don't say what the mind is, how can you actually say where it is? So, but you've asked for where, so we're going to go, go along with it as an emergent process. So let's just see how it goes without, without doing it. It is kind of funny, isn't it? <laughs> so where is the mind is hard to address if we don't say what the mind is. Are you with me on that? So, so maybe we should go back to what? So at least you can see, because people are, are, you're making comments from the benches and I'm up, this body is up here on the stage. We're talking about our bodies doing something with each other, right? And if I came here and I did something like this, do you want to talk about the mind tonight? Let me think about it. And I went like that. It would be a very different experience, wouldn't it? So something is happening now between this body and the body that's sitting in the bench. Would you agree with that? So, so we just have to keep in mind about the where of it all. There's something happening in the betweenness between this body and the body you're sitting in, right? So that's an interesting thing just to start out with the where, just to stick with the where for a moment, that there's a betweenness to it. But how many of you would say, whatever this mind thing is, which we'll get to next, perhaps, that it's also inside you? Anybody would feel your mind is also inside you? Raise your hand if you would say that's true. Let's just see. Okay, so we have this weird thing we've just come up with, that the mind, whatever it is, seems to be both between, like happening between us right now, and within. Well, that's interesting, or some people might say that's really bizarre, but we're saying there's one thing that might be in these two places all at once. So let's just keep track of that. So we'll come back to the where, because that's just a partial answer so far. But we've located in two places. So when my grandmother, Minnie, came here to ethical culture, she sat in one of the seats you're in, and someone was up here communicating issues about ideas and about visions for what the future might be or how people could, as Anne said, treat each other better. Or if you think about Jonathan's wonderful introduction, you know, this idea that you could live a life of kindness, which I think is consistent and right with the ethical culture principle. So this is a really interesting thing that for many, she would be taking in something from not just someone on the stage, but from other people sitting on the benches that we call community. So from an interpersonal neurobiology point of view, anthropology would study culture and how people communicate in communities and how this is passed across the generations. So an anthropologist sitting here, any anthropologists in the room? Um, but if there were, they would, because I've had some old friends of mine, anthropologists who were here, would say, yeah, that's what we study in anthropology. Or in sociology, you'd say, yes, groups get together and they affect each other. So we'll put a hold on, that's the where. Can we go to what, is that okay? 
Yeah, okay. So then the question is, what is the mind? Now let's just start with some of the data. The word mind, M-I-N-D, is a very interesting word. And its definition in the field of, let's say, where I come from, I'm a psychiatrist, psychiatrists, <coughs> excuse me, are the caretakers of the mind. We're the branch of medicine that takes care of the mind. So Rakshi is here, who's a wonderful person, trained in OBGYN, right, right Rakshi? Well, infectious, infectious diseases now. Didn't you start in OB? What's that? Oh, okay. Addiction, medicine, and infectious diseases. So there's a specialty of medicine. And in my specialty, we study the mind, supposedly. Now, any other psychiatrists in the room? Okay, a couple. So what were you told is the definition of mind when you were trained as a psychiatrist? Exactly. So, um, and that's what I was told, too. I wish we could see your face. It was like, what was that? <laughs> So it's per your personality, is the mind is your personality. Okay, so that's an interesting description. So in the field of psychiatry, there actually is no definition of the mind. And how many of you are psychologists in the room? Okay, and what were you told as a definition, not a description like personality or feelings or thoughts, but a definition of what the mind is? Oh, someone told you it was a flow of energy. Oh, last week, okay, right, but <laughs> thank you. Good, good, it's finally catching up with us. But in general, the field of psychology, I've asked many chair people of departments of psychiatry, psychology, there is no definition of the mind in psychology or psychiatry or anthropology. And here's the most amazing thing. Caroline and I had dinner the other night with um, a professor of the philosophy of mind. And I already interviewed a bunch of philosophers of mind, so I sort of knew this, so it wasn't so surprising to me. But I asked her, what's your definition of mind? She goes, oh, come on, you know we don't have one. <laughs> because they don't. In fact, in the philosophy of mind, you are not supposed to define the mind. I'm not kidding. I have dear friends who are philosophers of mind, including this new friend we just made. And if you say to them, well, you just wrote a book with mind in the title, but you don't define it, they go, of course not. Well, please explain that, because once you define it with words, you limit your understanding. So then I said, well, why do you have a word for mind? And they go, because it's a placeholder for the unknown. So this is what I say to, whether it's research psychologists or psychiatrists or, or philosophers who say this, I said, I said, that makes total sense. Makes total sense. You know, psyche, which is, you know, in, in the Webster's Dictionary is defined as the soul, the spirit, the intellect, and the mind. Those are synonyms for psyche. So a psychiatrist is a caretaker of the soul and the mind. So I said, well, look, if I go to a person who's coming to me for psychotherapy, right, what would that be a therapy of? Therapy of the mind, of the soul, right? And my patient, as psychiatrists, we call people patients. You can call them clients. You know, we, in our interpersonal neurobiology study group, we decided we'll drop those two terms and call them fellow travelers, because that's probably more accurate. So if a fellow traveler comes and you're joining them on the journey of life, trying to help them find more well-being and less suffering, um, and they say to you, well, you're my mind therapist, right? And you go, yeah. And then they say, well, what is my mind? And you say, it's a placeholder for the unknown. Why would they continue seeing you, <laughs> right? So, th so this is really a problem. Caroline is here, was trained originally as an attorney, and she has a number of her attorney friends who went to law school with her right here on the benches. So let me ask you guys something. Are you ready? When you went to law school, did anyone define what a law is? Yes. Debbie? Junaid, you, you would say no? Oh, that, but you were in the same class the same year. <laughs> you were a calcitrant student, you. Caroline, did someone say what a law is? Yes, okay. So we have three yeses, one no. Okay, <clears throat> so that's interesting. We could talk about that later on. <clears throat> but the issue is that in our professions, we usually define what we're doing. 
right? Doesn't that make sense? So for me, it became very strange that the what of the mind didn't have a definition short of descriptions. So my mother-in-law sometimes talks about the issue of what I do, and I, I try to explain to her that, you know, this issue of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, right, the DSM, is a listing of symptoms of syndromes that never says what the mental is of the mental disorders. You probably know that, right? You're all familiar with the DSM. And the DSM never says what the mind is, and of course it never says what a healthy mind is. So you have, now I've asked 100,000 mental health professionals all around this planet, from all the different fields you can imagine, were you ever told what the mind is? And two to five percent people, of people raise their hand and say yes. Ninety-five percent of people around the globe say no. We were just in London. I was at the Royal Institute of Britain teaching there, and someone came to me there who said, you know, I was at the place where you crossed the 100,000 mark, which was at the Royal College of Physicians, also in London. And it was an incredibly exciting moment because I had 99,000, you know, 650 votes already that I recorded all these things. And then I said, you know, there were 400 people in the room. I said, we're going to pass the 100,000 mark, let's just see how it goes, 400 people in the room, and then when I said, how many of you, you know, got a definition of what the mind is, right, then about 10 people raised their hand of 400. But this happened all over the place. So the data is very clear. The word mind doesn't have a definition. It isn't even that there are competing definitions. There are lots of descriptions. Of course, what do we mean when we say the word mind? What, what do we mean at a minimum? Throw out something that you know is a part of your mind. Thoughts, feelings, exactly. What else? What's that? The brain. Yes, in fact, people sometimes equate mind as brain activity. They use those words as synonyms. So in a recent psychology textbook by John Cassiopo and his colleagues, he defines the mind as brain activity related to feelings, thoughts, and behavior. Now, who was the first person who said that's probably the truth? Does anyone know? That in recorded history. Who's the first person that made mind basically a synonym for brain activity? Hippocrates. 2,500 years ago in a book called On the Sacred Disease, about epilepsy. And he didn't just say that the brain influences the mind. He says all our joys and sorrows, all the things that are part of our mind, come only, and I emphasize his word, only from what happens in your head, your brain. Now, if mind is the same as brain activity, I mean a synonym for it, then we're done. This should be a talk about the brain. But what's the fundamental problem with equating the word mind with the brain activity? There's no evidence for it. There's no evidence for it. It's actually, even though it's scientifically common to say, there's, there's actually a lot of evidence saying the brain influences your feelings and thoughts, but no one anywhere has figured out how, in fact, neural firing and let's just use a general term, subjective experience, how it could possibly cause it. Nor has anyone actually demonstrated scientifically that your subjective experience <clears throat> is limited to your head. Now, who is the father, the grandfather of modern psychology? Who's often attributed with that title? William James, and in 1890, William James said in The Principles of Psychology that, in fact, it's so obvious that the mind is just basically brain activity that let's go on from there. Now, James knew the body was important, but the body was a consequence of what was going on in the brain. Now, why is this even a problem? It's a problem because, first of all, how many of you feel like if you eat something really weird and it affects your stomach, or now we know if something affects the bacteria in your intestines 
that it will affect your feelings, thoughts, and behavior. Anyone know that? Yeah. So why is the body being left out as the source of mind? That's just a weird scientific error. And the second thing is, how many of you have had, how many of you have had the experience where your relationship with people close to you, whether it's friends or family or neighbors or whatever, your relationships, how many of you would say that your relationships shape your feelings, thoughts, and behavior. Anybody feel that way? Yeah, so why would you leave relationships out of it? So here's what I'm gonna say to you, is that the mind being equated with brain activity, not, not just influenced by brain activity, but equated with it, has been around for 2,500 years. When you walk in the halls of academia, if you don't go along with that view, you're considered a Luddite. You're considered someone going backwards in time. And so it's a, it's a standard view to say mind simply means brain activity. And when I was in training and became a researcher in attachment, it was the beginning of the decade of the brain. And this just seemed to be, as a scientist, yes, the common view, but actually a mistaken view, scientifically wrong and clinically problematic and societally a serious, serious assault on truth. So, what is the mind? So here's the first little assignment we're going to do. If I say to you that, if you make a triangle, that somehow mind may be fundamentally related to your brain and its body, let's call that the embodied brain, and related to relationships, if mind is one thing, what could that one thing be that would be both in your whole body, including its brain, so we're not putting down the brain. The brain is awesome, brain science is great, everything we can learn about the brain is wonderful. We're just saying don't limit it to the brain, as 95% of scientists are doing these days in those fields. And I understand they get mad about this, but so be it. So, we're including the whole body, but then we're including what happens in the betweenness. So, what would be the process shared by the within and the between? It's not an easy answer, <clears throat> and in fact, it feels really strange to even think about the question. So when Deborah and Kevin and I had dinner, had lunch with Caroline, uh, we were, um, Deborah asked me, what, what do you want to do for your next book? And I said, well, you know, there's this really weird finding that people think the mind is just the brain, and, you know, someone ought to write a book about this fundamental issue that it might be actually incorrect. And Deborah said, well, why don't you write it? I said, because the only person who will probably read it is my mom. And you were so beautiful, Deborah, you said, that's okay. <laughs> so I started writing this book for my mom. My mom likes reading my books, so it's really, really fun. But this is the issue, you know, <laughs> that um, this isn't just an intellectual issue, because as you'll see, answering this question I'm, I'm, I'm inviting you to consider changes everything. It changes the way you raise children and families. It changes the way a teacher would teach kids in school. It changes the way the media would approach passing messages along. It changes the way you would live your individual life. It changes the way politics might happen. It even affects, as Jonathan didn't mention it, but Jonathan runs this wonderful set of programs on climate, brain, and mind, and behavior at the Garrison Institute, which is a wonderful institute combining inner wisdom <coughs> and social action. And um, when, Jonathan, you asked me to come speak to the climate, mind, and behavior uh, group, I said, well, you know, I'm not a climate expert. You said, it's okay, you can come, you can come. And it was amazing to go there and realize how this question about what the mind is has everything to do with what we do with this planet's future. Changing the conversation about what the mind is from the 2,500 years of scientific statements that the mind is just the brain 
could actually turn the pathway of cultural evolution around on this planet. So this question I'm asking you is not just, oh, we did this intellectual exercise. For people to experience this question we're addressing, the what of mind, from the inside out, will have you leave these doors of ethical culture with a different framework of how you conduct your life. So it's a hugely important question. And it's so embedded in how we raise children in schools or families that we often don't think about it, kind of like a fish swimming in an aquarium. But the water that surrounds us is as important as the plasma inside of our bodies. So I had a group together years ago, 1992, when I became a young faculty member at UCLA, I was running the training program in child psychiatry. I invited all my old professors together, 40 of them in a room. We were gonna ask one question, what is the connection between the brain and the mind? It's a long story, but the short version is, everyone could agree on the brain, 100 billion neurons, they have all these connections, really cool, lots of electrical and, and chemical energy going on, and they're fine. The mind, no one could agree upon it. And there were all these different representatives in there. So I went to the beach, during the interval, interval week, thinking, how am I going to save this party from collapsing? And as I'm walking on the beach, I'm thinking, if someone asked me, what is the coast, what would I say? And if I were a full-time university employee, which I was, and someone really required that I be a specialist in the ocean or a specialist in the sand, I actually might miss the answer because the coast is created by both sand and sea. You don't get the coast unless you see the whole thing. So then I started thinking, well, what would the whole thing be of the mind? How could an anthropologist studying culture of something happening in communities that passes across generations be related to what a neuroscientist studies inside the skull? How could it be one thing? How could there be a continuity between cortex and culture? So that's what I'm asking you to consider. What would that be? So if, you, if you're really looking at the coast, if you're really looking at the mind, you would say that, well, anthropologists study energy and information sharing in a culture that relationships in groups that a sociologist studies are energy and information sharing in a group. A linguistic expert would be studying how energy and information are shared in language. And a psychologist studies thoughts and feelings and memories and attention, which are basically, if you think about it, energy and information flow. Flow means change. Information is a pattern of energy with symbolic value. We'll get to energy in a few moments. But Energy and information flow would be the fundamental aspect of the system. And then you go, well, what happens inside the brain? It's basically electrochemical energy flow that has symbolic value called a neural representation. So we have a common ground between a neuroscientist and an anthropologist and everyone in between. So, okay, so that's the first part of looking at what the coast would, of the mind would be. The second question is, what would the mind be? Let's say it's true. Energy and information flow is the system. Big deal. What's the mind? It's not an easy one, but if you look at the system, this system has three properties to it, and if you're familiar with math, you would recognize these properties as the essential features that get you the category of what's called a complex system. And they are that you're open to influences from outside yourself. So let me ask you, how many of you feel like stuff from outside of what you would call you influences you? Anybody think they're an open system? Okay, so you are an open system. That's number one. Number two is the quality called chaos capable, meaning you can have a very chaotic day. Anybody have a chaotic day recently? Okay, so you are a chaos-capable open system. And the third, and in some ways, mathematicians feel the most important quality is called nonlinear. 
and nonlinear means a small input leads to large and on the surface difficult to predict results. How many of you feel like you yourself are nonlinear? Anybody? Okay. So you are a nonlinear, chaos capable open system. That means in mathematical terms, you are a complex system. Now, here's the important thing about the math of complex systems. And this doesn't come from just a California feel good view. This is hard science of mathematics. Complex systems have a particular feature to them called emergence, where the interaction of the elements of the system give rise to stuff. That's called an emergent property. One of the emergent properties we're going to examine tonight is self-organization. And self-organization is the emergent property of a complex system that regulates its own becoming. And self-organization is completely counterintuitive, meaning if here's the system right here, what's arising from it, that's the emergent property, What's arising from it is a function called self-organization that turns back and regulates that from which it becomes, meaning it is regulating then the stuff from which it is now continually arising. It's called a recursive property. It makes no sense in, intuitively. It's ridiculous. How can you actually regulate the thing from which you're arising, which then you turn back and regulate? But that's what the math predicts. That's why clouds, for example, have the incredible shapes they do. So in this intervening week, I'm thinking, what if the mind were both embodied and relational, that's its location, and it were the, it is, it were, it, were, it could be, what was the proper linguistic thing? And it, what if it were, is that correct, Deborah? Yes, thank you. See, she's a wonderful editor. <laughs> Even live action editing, thank you. If it were the self-organizing, emergent, embodied, and relational process, what would it be doing? It'd be regulating energy and information flow where? Within you and between you. So like right now, I am watching all your faces, and if you started all looking away when I started talking about certain things, I'd probably start talking about other things, just so we could stay connected. So here's what I propose that group. The mind is, besides consciousness and subjective experience and information processing, we'll get to those in a few minutes, but putting those aside, this fourth facet of mind is the self-organizing, emergent, embodied and relational process that regulates energy information flow within you and between you. And then once you make that proposal of defining the mind, here's what you get. You get the opportunity to ask this question. What is a healthy mind? And that question can be answered, unlike descriptions of the mind, because if you say, oh, your mind is your thoughts, you can't then say, what's, what's a healthy mind? You go, well, healthy thoughts. That does, there's, there's nothing scientifically logical about that. Or your mind is your feelings. Okay, great. That's true, of course. Those are descriptions. What's a healthy feeling? Well, you can't answer that. But with math, you can ask the question, what is optimal self-organization? And you get optimal self-organization amazingly with an incredibly simple process that doesn't have a name in math, but it's defined this way, differentiation, making different, and then linking. The linkage of differentiated parts in common English terms, this isn't what you'd use in math, but for English terms, you would just say integration. Integration is comprised of two steps, differentiate and then link. So what's interesting about that is we've just come up with a definition, so we've said what the mind is, and we've even just said, how does the mind create well-being? The mind creates well-being by integrating within and between. What does integration between feel like? It's where you honor differences and promote compassionate, respectful linkages. It's where you honor different species and respect what they need and honor those differences and then promote steps to actually keep living beings alive and well. What is internal integration? Well, you can look at the body, for example, and how the body connects throughout itself, differentiates heart from lungs, from intestines, from brain, and then links all those systems together. Or if you want to look at the brain, you can look at how the higher parts are differentiated from the lower parts and how they link together, or even how the left and right link together in all sorts of ways that we'll talk about in just a moment. 
So here's the proposal. The what of mind is something people don't talk about, but an embodied and relational process. And that, I can tell you from direct experience, gets academics often extremely irritated. Because you can't stick the whole mind in a brain scanner. The mind is fully embodied, not just in sculled. And here's the secret. Skull nor skin is a boundary for energy and information to flow. So the system that gives rise to mind is one system, one system that is within you and between you. It's happening right now in your intestines, in your lungs, in your heart, in your muscles, and in your brain. And it's happening now between me and you, right at this very moment. So the what of mind lets us answer the question, the where. The mind is within and between. And I hope it's starting to feel like it's not so weird as maybe initially it felt. So we've done what, we've done where, we even have addressed initially how, how does the mind function in health and unhealth? So the proposal is that health comes from integration, unhealth comes from impaired integration. It's that simple. And amazingly, here's what the math says. Impaired integration leads to either chaos or rigidity or both. And then if you look at the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, every symptom of every syndrome can be reinterpreted as chaos, or rigidity, or both. For example, in post-traumatic stress disorder, we have experts in the room in that area, the intrusive memories, the flooding of feelings of the body are examples of chaotic symptoms. Or rigidity is you shut yourself off, you feel numb in your body, or you start socially withdrawing. The same thing can be seen with things not related to experiential causes, like manic depressive illness. What do you see? You see the chaos of mania and the rigidity of depression. So back in 1992, here was the proposal. Health comes from integration, period. And then anything you might do as a clinician or a teacher or a parent to promote integration would promote resilience and well-being. And how you would do this is you'd look for chaos or rigidity, and then you would find some domain of integration that was impaired, and you'd do work in that. And and it was amazing that that framework was scientifically inspired and clinically useful. So for, I know some of my students are here in the room, you know that if you learn this practice, it doesn't matter if you're trained in you know, different forms of therapy, this doesn't replace that. It's not a form of therapy, it just informs therapy. So in psychoanalytic work or other forms of psychodynamic work, narrative therapy, body-based therapy, EMDR, cognitive therapy, all sorts of um, f approaches, even neurofeedback, can use the principles of interpersonal neurobiology we've just outlined for the what and the where and the how. And so let's get to the other three, and then we're going to open it up more for discussion. So we have what? We have when, we have why, and what's the other one? Who. <clears throat> so let's do, what do you want to do? When? You want to do when. Okay, that's a tough one. But we can do when. We'll do when. Because we have when, who, and why. All right, so when. Let's do when. So when is the mind? This is so much an assault on the standard view in psychology for 125 years and in the field of medicine for 2,500 years that for a reader to be open to considering that maybe that view is only a part of a much larger story, that is, mind is brain activity, needs to be expanded in, in our understanding. I felt that this book had to have an immediacy to it so when the reader goes through the reading, it's not just a download of information 
but it's kind of an invitation to have an experience. And for the people who may have read the book already, and I know some of my early readers are in the room, you know, from the manuscript days, uh, how would you write such a book so that as a person reads word by word in the moment of reading, in terms of the when of mind, how would you actually invite someone to have an experience rather than just getting a download of facts? What would you do as a writer? Tell stories, exactly. Tell stories, and I'm, I'm trained as actually a narrative scientist by Jerry Bruner, who, I don't know if he's still here in New York, but he was in New York. Um, and Jerry would, <coughs> would teach us that narrative is this telling uh, of a sequence of events. This is how Jerry Bruner, uh, was, some people consider the father of, of modern uh, cognitive psychology. The, um, it's the telling of a sequence of events, and it has two layers. It has the, the action things that happen, the landscape of action is what Jerry calls it, and the landscape of consciousness is what Jerry calls it. But, you know, since I was his, uh, his graduate student, I can tell you, he really means the landscape of the mind, you know, and it doesn't have to be in consciousness, but it's mental life, right? So I felt exactly. I felt it had to be stories. Now, Deborah and I have gone back and forth over this. Is what kind of stories are you allowed to tell in a, in a, in a book? You know, right, Deb? <laughs> so, what's that? Short ones, short ones. But I felt like if you're inviting someone to really consider their own mind, I had to put my own mind in here. So I didn't want this to be a story about my relationship with my mother and my father and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's stuff that really didn't seem relevant to this whole thing. So I wanted to write a book of stories which I could talk about from the inside out, from my own experience. So it would invite you as the reader in the present moment of reading to allow yourself to explore your own experiences. Now, here's the interesting thing. There's a whole field, as you probably know, called mindfulness, which has the word mind in it. And Caroline has been med doing mindfulness meditation for a long time and is my initial teacher of that. So I, I'm re relatively new to it, but in the academic world of mindfulness, there's this push against looking at the past or worrying about the future. It's all about like living in the moment. So then I thought, oh my God, how are you going to write a book that's a mindful, mindful book in a way that's going into stories about the past? That's kind of like the antithesis of this idea of just living in the present moment. So the reality is that being present includes something that Endel Tolvin calls mental time travel. It means you sit in the present moment, reflecting on the past and imagining the future, connecting past, present, and future. That's a reality, I think, of being present. Just use that word instead of mindful and get away from the academic arguments about it. So <coughs> I wanted the reader to have the experience of being present herself or himself as they went through the reading. So then there's the issue of what is time? What is time? So let me ask you a question just before I get into the, the physics of time. How many of you have had in your own mental lives the experience that sometimes there's a feeling of time just going really fast and things going by and it feels like you can't have enough time and it's just going to keep on flowing. And if you have that experience, raise your hand if you do. Okay. This quality of a directionality, this something some people call the arrow of time, it keeps on going, going, going. And then how many of you have also felt, in addition to that, that sometimes things feel timeless? Just there's this open spaciousness. Raise your hand if you've had that feeling. Okay, so you can see it's a majority of people on both counts. So <clears throat> how do we explain that? How do we explain that? So in the definition of mind, we have this statement as a proposal, and the whole book is based on questions rather than answers. Because for me, for a book to invite you as a reader to join in the journey, it's not I say, here's the answer. It's here's a question. Let's explore it together. And you'll come up with your answering unfolding, and I'll come up with my answering unfolding. And who knows what the answer is, but let's look at what the questions are. That's why the interrogatives are the, the kind of this, the scaffold of the whole book. <clears throat> and in these stories, the stories are filled with questions. 
So then the question is, if the majority of people have a mental experience that is both time-bound and timeless, what's with that? How do we look at science to explore that subjective experience? And the whole basis of mind is that that word embodies subjective experience. Subjective experience means you cannot directly observe it outside of the person having it. It can't be measured. Even if I see red and you see red and we have 25 versions of red and we point to the same red and say, see, we're seeing the same red, I have no idea if your experience of red is the same as mine. I will never have an idea like that. Part of the whole drive of art and part of why I put a bunch of photographs in the book is because you don't know what another person's subjective experience is. We can try to reach that, but you can never really know. I do this two-day immersion in these ideas for these teenage girls who have eating issues, and uh, so I did the same thing. You know, there's a hundred of them in the room, whatever, including their parents and the staff, and <clears throat> so I said, how many of you know I'm waving my hand? And this, everyone raises their hand, but this one 13-year-old girl. And I said, okay, well, what I mean by no is how many of you are aware I'm waving my hand? Everyone raises their hand except her. So I said, do something else. I said, well, how many of you are conscious that I'm waving my hand? She won't raise her hand. So I said, okay, you're not raising your hand. She goes, nope. I go, okay. Do you want to share with us what your experience is? And the most amazing thing happened. She says, you know, <coughs> even if I have the subjective experience of being aware that you're waving your hand, it might actually be an illusion that I can't really rely on. Because, you know, there are different levels of reality. And that level of reality is not something I want to linguistically put a mark on and just say I'm having it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This actually was being recorded. It was absolutely unbelievable. So I look at her. I say, well, can you say more about that? And then she gives this quantum analysis of the difference between, and not using the phrases of quantum theory, but using the essence of quantum theory and comparing it to Newtonian classical physics. Her therapist is sitting right near her, and he's looking like, oh, she must be psychotic. You know, he's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, I didn't know she had psychosis as one of her diagnoses, right? And I'm looking at him, and so what I say to her is I said, do you realize you're talking like a PhD student in quantum physics? And she goes, what's that? And I look at him, I go, come talk to me at the break. So she, she comes with him at the break, talks to me about it, and this kid was so intuitive about the fact that you have these two levels of reality. We'll talk about it once. Anyway, the bottom line is we have subjective experience, we have consciousness. So hold on, hold on, we're getting there, we're getting there. So here's the issue. When you talk about energy flow as the system that gives rise to mind, we're suggesting that it could be that Subjective experience is an emergent property of energy, may be distinct from self-organization, may be overlapping. Let's just put that aside for now. And the way you know you're having subjective experience is with consciousness. Fine. You also have something called information processing, which are patterns of energy which have symbolic value that can be in consciousness or not. So Freud talked about the unconscious and stuff like that. And now we have in neuroscience and in cognitive science all sorts of proof that you have lots of information processing. In fact, the majority of it is outside of consciousness. Okay, fine. So we've named subjective experience, consciousness, information processing, and self-organization as four facets of mind. They may all be emergent properties of energy flow. Okay, fine. So that's just a statement of where we're at at this moment. So then you say, well, okay, what about time? When is all this happening? So who is the expert to turn to if you're going to really dive deeply into energy. You turn to physicists. So right around this time, <clears throat> I get this email saying, will you please come to Tuscany to work for a week as a faculty member at a conference with 150 physicists looking at the relationship between spirituality and science um, and on our dime. So I said to Caroline, is that 
what do you think? She goes, of course. <laughs> so anyway, those were the days I could eat pasta when I was eating gluten. So <clears throat> there we were, me with 150 physicists. So you can imagine what I might do with them on these long walks around the monastery and over pasta and wine, asking them two, <coughs> two questions, which we haven't addressed yet. What is energy and what is time? So I'll give you a summary of those, convers <coughs> excuse me, those conversations and talk to you about the notion that quantum physics is a very interesting branch of physics. And if you're really going to look at energy, for example, not something weird. I mean, it's unusual, but it's not weird. It's like these lights are sending photons through the air. They're bouncing off my body, and they're going into your eyes. Okay? That's what we mean by energy. Or I speak. The vocal cords inside my body shake the air that's being projected by my lungs. That's kinetic motion of air molecules. So I'm not talking about anything weird. Because in terms of this stuff we're doing through Norton, you know, the idea of getting a conversation going on the planet about what is the mind, one of the pushbacks has been, well, you're saying the mind is an emergent property of energy, and energy is not a scientific concept. That's what people say. And I go, well, what? You, you actually couldn't get more basic in science than energy. Biology is based on energy. Chemistry is based on energy. They say, well, but the mind should never have energy is something you're dealing with. I say, well, why not? So when you go to the experts in energy, they're physicists, especially quantum physicists, here's the weird, weird, weird reality. You live in a body. How many of you would say you live in a body? Okay, so you live in a body. Your body is an accumulation of molecules that make up systems that create the whole body. It's a big old thing. You may not think it's big, but it's bigger than like a photon, right? Would you agree with that? Now, here's the strange reality we live on, at least on Earth, that there are a set of physics principles called classical physics that are also known as Newtonian physics. Those are synonyms. So that if I drop this, um, if I drop this microphone, where is it going to go? It's going to go down because we know gravity, which is a property of classical physics, will guarantee that if I drop it, it's going to go down. You know that. It's not a probability. It's a certainty. So here's the weird thing about the equations at the large body level. They are Newtonian classical physics equations. When Jonathan does the beautiful work he does, and if you haven't read Jonathan's new book, it is fabulous, The Well-Tempered City is a gorgeous book, and it's both about architectural things you do, but also things you do as a system, so it blends these two things in a beautiful way, and I highly urge you to read that book. But from an architectural point of view, when you build a building, you want to build a Newtonian building. You don't want it to say this building will probably stay up, but maybe it won't, <laughs> you know? So the way to feel it in your body is Newtonian things are based on certainties. So when you get in a car and you drive your car, you press on the brakes, it's a Newtonian car. It will stop, assuming all the mechanics work. Or when you get in an airplane, for example, you want it to be a Newtonian airplane. You don't want to get on the plane and say, this one will probably get over to L.A. this time. So my kids always tell me I'm missing the joke gene, and I think they're right. Uh, so I decided to try one joke in the book. And I'm going to try to say it to you right now. But if I fail, please don't let them know that. So I'm getting on a plane from New York to LA. And as we're all gathered and we're all about to get ready to take off, we have our seatbelts on, there's a big explosion. And everyone freaks out, of course, right? And I look out the window, and there the emergency slide has been shoved out in the explosion that it does to get out there. So I undo my seatbelt and I pop up with my phone and I take a picture that you'll see in the book of this slide that gets there. So of course the, the flight attendant is really pissed off and she says, go sit down. I said, one moment, one moment, I gotta take a picture of this. Because it's the perfect example of what we're talking about. The plane is a Newtonian plane, but what had happened was there was the guy fixing the plane who probably was with his mind 
distracted. Maybe he was worrying about an argument he had with a colleague or something was going on at home or whatever. And because his mind is a quantum mind, as you'll see in a moment, it was about probabilities, not certainties, and he pulled the lever and ejected the thing, and we were delayed about four hours while they shoved the stuff back in. <laughs> Get back in there, right? So what I say is that while the plane was a Newtonian plane, he was a quantum mechanic. <laughs> Did I do it? Thank you. <laughs> okay, now you don't have to read that in the book. <laughs> so, okay, so here's the deal, here's the deal. At small sizes, quantum effects <laughs> are more prevalent. They're actually also present in mass. Because remember what Einstein said, energy equals mass times speed of light squared. So even though you live in a big body that's full of mass, it's very condensed energy. So there are quantum effects on your body too. But you don't see them <coughs> as readily, fortunately. So, we're beginning to get into the time issue of when by looking at the following strange reality. You're born into a body that has Newtonian classical physics that are at its large scale, getting it to operate in certain ways. But you have a mind, and if our proposal is correct, that the mind is an emergent property of energy, that's our proposal, right? then the rules that govern the mind will be more related to quantum rules on certain levels than Newtonian rules. Everybody with me? We'll get into some of those rules later, but to look at the issue you've asked to look at now, the when of mind, here's the bottom line of a number of physicists' view on time. Time as something that flows looks like is a mental illusion. There is nothing, according to many physicists, that is flowing like a river. Even though the awareness of change may be what we call time. So that's really, really interesting. <clears throat> that there may, <coughs> there may be nothing that's flowing called time. Now, change happens. So when you go through the mathematics of it, and writing this book, you know, I went deeply into math of all these different things, but then translated into kind of common language and use. Here's the issue. When you take, let's say, an electron, it has the quality called a microstate. Let's just stay with that, that it's, it's, it's an entity, it's a process that has a very kind of simplic a simplicity to it. It's a microstate. <clears throat> but when you accumulate a bunch of microstates together, it's called a macrostate. So, there's <coughs> a process by which macrostate accumulations have this process that relates to the Big Bang and the unfolding of the universe, which I won't get into here, but just to say this, that at the macrostate level you have something called the arrow of time. Let's say you and I were in a kitchen. We took an egg. It's a macro state, right? We break the egg open, and what happens to the egg? It splays all over the counter. We cannot unbreak the egg. It's got a directionality to time to change because it's a macro state. Quantum experiences are timeless. Newtonian classical physics experiences of macrostates are, are arrow-bound. So, coming back to your subjective experience, we now have an understanding of something that troubled me since I've been 11 years of age, and my dear friend John is here from when we were 16, we became friends. You know how these used to always bug me, these, these levels of analysis. Finally, when I wrote this book, I figured out what had been bugging us since we were kids. You have these two levels. Consciousness is a microstate, as we'll talk about in a few moments. 
that is arrow-free and timeless. But the thing you're conscious of is a macro state that has this quality of unfolding, like the body you live in or awareness of a thought you're having. The thought comes and it goes, and it comes and it goes, and you can't get it back. But the process of knowing in consciousness compared to the knowns, the knowing is timeless. Does that resonate with anyone? Raise your hand if that feels like, yeah, okay. So when I was writing this, it was like, oh my God, this is like far out. This is so amazing, you know? And it was like all the things that John and I used to talk about since we were kids, like going, whoo, yeah, this is wild. So here's the thing about that. The when of mind is that there is no such thing as time and everything is happening now. That's the simplest thing to say. Everything is happening now. But your subjective experience of now can either be arrow bound and it feels like things are unfolding and folding and folding, you can't get them back and you have existential angst and all this kind of stuff. But the knowing of consciousness is arrow free and it is a deep source of peace in many, many ways. <clears throat> now, as I was beginning this journey of writing all this stuff, I started a, a study uh, that, let's see, we've done the when now. What are we going to do next? Why and what was the other one? What's that? How. Well, we did how, integration. Who. Yeah, let's do the who. Let's do the who and the why. The who and the why. <coughs> so, I think I'll, I'll share a story with you that um, it, it, it's not an easy story to tell, but it's, I think it, it, for me it embodies this issue. My father died about four years ago. It was his mom who used to come here. And um, he was a, a very, um, very devoted mechanical engineer who really was into you know, practical applications of science and um, was not into talking about spirituality or anything like that. And he became ill and was quite ill for a long time. And at the very end of <coughs> his life, he asked me what was happening to him. As a physician, I looked at his you know, medical records and looked at his vital signs, and he asked me if he was dying. <coughs> Excuse me. And I said, Dad, I, I think you're dying. Not like we're all dying, but I mean like you're dying today or tomorrow kind of thing. So he said to me, what's going to happen to me? Now, he and I had a long history of different conflicts about all sorts of things you can imagine. Um, but the last thing I wanted to do was have this last visit with him be where he asked me to leave the house uh, again. So um, I was going to choose my words really carefully. Like, what do you say to your mechanical engineer dad who says, I'm dying, what's going to happen to me? So this is what I said to him. <clears throat> it was a few years um, since I had been at that meeting with the scientists, the physicists, and I told you about the time part of those conversations, <clears throat> but now we're going to talk about the energy part. And in the who and the why, for me, it's, uh, and maybe it's because I'm a scientist at heart, but it's really crucial to make sure this whole um, exploration of mind is coherent. It's why I wrote the book as stories, to kind of ask you as a reader to go on the journey to have you yourself feel its coherence or not. It shouldn't be someone else says, this is the way it is, blah, blah, blah. No, it should be where you feel it from the inside out so the way you comport your life can reflect that it feels right for you. And if it doesn't, throw it away. So <clears throat> when I would ask these physicists what energy was. For me, it was a really important question because if this proposal is true, if we're going to break the code of silence and actually have a definition of the mind for what seems like the first time short of calling it brain activity, um, it ought to be really rigorous, <coughs> really rigorous. So if you make the proposal, based on where we've come in our discussion tonight, that the mind is a, an emergent property of energy, and whether that's just subjective experience, consciousness, information processing, or self-organization, the proposal is that any of those four things may be emergent properties of energy flow. So what is energy, right? The word flow simply means change. 
If we want to put information in there, that's fine. That's a pattern of energy with symbolic value. Some physicists, by the way, <coughs> see the universe as comprised of information, and energy comes from that. Other people see the process being, um, oh, I have that. Rebecca, you are so kind. Someone gave, Dan gave me these before. Yes, I'm going to take this one. Thank you for reminding me. Oh, now that's empathy. Thank you, Rebecca. <clears throat> we have a funny story to tell, but I won't tell it right now about how <laughs> Rebecca, well, that's a long story, never mind. <laughs> okay. So, I know you're not supposed to talk while you're chewing, but I'm not chewing, it's just a cough drop. So, uh, I'm saying that with my mom in my mind. Um, thanks, mom. So, <clears throat> so, that's why to ask the question, what's energy? So, you know, they wave their hands and say, well, it's in different forms, you know, there's light energy, there's sound energy, there's electrical energy, there's chemical energy. It's an actual thing in the world. I said, okay, fine. What is it? Well, it has different frequencies, you know, for sound, different frequencies. It has different forms it can take. It has different, you know, locations it can be in, different intensities. So I said, okay, okay, it has different contours. So I made up an acronym, I'm an acronym addict. Cliff, you know, contours, locations, intensity, frequency, form. Okay, fine. So that's the way you might describe the change of energy. So flow means change. All right, fine. But what is it, I would say to them. They go, what do you mean, what is it? I said, what is it? You've given me descriptions of it. That's not enough. What is it? You can imagine. This was more helpful over wine, I can tell you. So I said, okay. And this, I was asking a number of different people there, so I got different perspectives. It's not necessarily what they say, but it's, I mean, they, what they write about, but it's what they say. So here's what they said. They said, energy is the movement from possibility to actuality. I said, can you say more about that? They said, yeah. All energy is the movement from this sea of potential into an actualization of one of those potentials through a series of probabilities. I said, you're kidding. I said, no. I said, that is beautiful. I go, what? I said, that is beautiful. So let's think about that. Energy is the movement from possibility to actuality through a series of probabilities. Oh, and I'm walking around this monastery and I'm going, oh my God, that's what the mind is, right? When you have a thought, it comes from a pool. Let's say you could have a hundred billion thoughts, but one emerged. And just below this peak, if you made it into a graph, they, they call it the probability distribution curve. And this curve goes between near zero or zero upward to 100%. So imagine this. Let's say there were a billion words I could say to you. Which word am I going to choose right now? What's your chance of guessing which of the billion words I'm going to choose? I'm going to choose one. What's your chance of guessing it? One out of a billion. So it's pretty close to zero, right? That's why the physicists like to call it near zero. All right, so imagine the bottom of your graph, if you're drawing this a piece of paper, near zero or zero is Dan is going to say a word, right? And now I say ethical culture. So I've chosen a phrase, right? That's a point at 100%. I said it. And as I was thinking about saying it, it would have been just below the 100% mark. So the peak of this graph would be a peak of actualization. The sub-peak value would be thinking, or if I had an emotion, below that peak of emotion would be emoting. If I had a memory, below that peak of memory would be remembering. Or I might be in a certain mood to say all the different buildings in New York City. How many buildings are there, Jonathan? I don't know. Eight hundred thousand buildings. Okay, so eight hundred thousand is a lot smaller than a billion, right? So that would be what's called a plateau. There's eight hundred thousand buildings. I'm going to name one of them. So one out of eight hundred thousand is a bigger number than one out of a billion. That's a plateau, and that would be a mood or intention or a state of mind. 
So then the question is, how does the mind relate to any of that stuff? So I say to my dad, I said, look, you came about 90 years ago when a sperm and egg in New York City found their way to each other of all the different sperm and egg that get together, one unique sperm, one unique egg got together and they made this body that's been yours. You are a very unique person, which made him very happy. So I said, so the way energy works is you come from a sea of potential into an actualization and you get about a hundred years to live in this body. I said, <clears throat> no one in the 30 years I've been a therapist has ever come to me and said, Dan, I am really freaking out. Where was I before I was conceived? No one worries about that. But of course, people worry about where they're going to go after they die. So I said, look, I said to my father, I said, no one worries about that, but what if you're going to the exact same place? And he goes, what do you mean? I said, you came from this sea of potential. You had this hundred years to live in this body. Awesome. Fantastic. What if you're going to melt back into this sea of potential? And he gets this beautiful, peaceful smile on his face. And he says, that makes me feel really, really good. Thank you. I said, you're welcome. And then he died. Soon after that. For real. And it was a beautiful thing. We were holding hands for about an hour while we talked about that. But it changed my relationship with death, i got to tell you. Because in many ways, this is what you get. Now, the thing I want to say, and that's kind of about the when of mind, is we do have these two things. To expand on the when, we're going to now go to the who we are. And we're going to start with a simple thing, but then we're going to get to a little bit more complex thing. The simple thing is you are both a conduit and a constructor. This is now the who. A conduit is something that allows energy to flow through it. In this case, we're talking about the mind, but it would be like a hose that allows water to flow through it. It doesn't change it much. It just lets it flow. That's a conduit. So, like, how many of you had the experience of going for a walk in nature? You let yourself drop out of your thinking and just let the wind feel, the wind caress your skin. You let your hair blow, and you are now really joining with the path. Have any of you had that experience? So there you're being a conduit, very important part of life. But sometimes you need to think about stuff and inf do information processing, and you have to be a constructor of energy patterns that have informational value if you're dealing with a legal issue or whatever. So you're both a conduit and a constructor of energy flow. Very, very different from each other. Integration, we said, is health. So honoring the differences and promoting the linkages of conduit and constructor, really important. A lot of people in modern life are mostly constructors. They forgot how to be a conduit. They don't go just dancing, get in the flow of dancing. They don't go get lost in nature. They don't get lost in music. They're busy, busy, busy with a monkey mind, you know? It's too much construction, but we want to balance that out. You don't want to just be a conduit. You don't want to just be a constructor. Differentiate and link. That's well-being. Okay, fine. That's one thing to say. But here's the other thing we are. Our name is Homo sapiens sapiens. What does sapire mean? To know. So we're not just the species that knows. We're the ones that know we know, which is kind of weird and neurotic, right? That's why we need so many therapists. Because <laughs> you're busy like, like, I know John can tell you for sure. Once we became teenagers, it was like, why don't I stop thinking about thinking and what's the purpose of life and when are we going to die and why do we even know we're going to die and who invented this goofy thing called being human? I think being human is one of the weirdest things in the world to be. It's a great privilege, but boy, who invented it? So here's what happened in a nutshell. I was working with clients, patients, fellow travelers, and I thought, if every form of developmental change seems to involve consciousness, like a teacher in school needs to involve the students who are conscious, or like a parent at home needs to have the kid be conscious, or if you're a therapist, you use consciousness. So, Consciousness seems to be necessary for change, right? So, what if you combine that universal finding, what's called con a concilian finding, across different disciplines you find a common ground, 
What if you combine, combine that with the process that says integration is health? If I asked you, how would you integrate consciousness? What would you say? Now, it's not easy. Um, Caroline and I were teaching in Singapore together, and we had this opportunity at the medical school there to have two graduate students with us. One, they're both third-year students. One was a third-year student studying the neuroscience of consciousness, the neural correlates of consciousness. How does the brain have its activity when you're conscious, right? The other was a person who had just come out of three years in solitude, where we, we actually had been there when we put him in a cave, and then he had just come out of the cave with his teacher. And then they had come with his teacher to Singapore. So we had these two wonderful young men, and I said to them at this dinner, we had a kind of a Jeffersonian dinner, we had one conversation, I said, this is an unbelievable opportunity. You both are young people studying consciousness. Yes, thank you. Um, what is consciousness? The neuroscience student started. He goes, we don't know. I said, well, how do you define it? He goes, I'm not sure. I said, you're a third-year student. He goes, yes. I said, well, then what are you studying? He goes, well, we don't know what it is. That's why we're studying it. I said, okay. And then I turned to the meditation student who had been three years in solitude. I mean, voluntarily in solitude. And I said, so what do you see consciousness as? He goes, I'm not sure, which his teacher wasn't so happy about that. And I said, well, what would you learn three years in a cave? He goes, my mind is very distractible. <laughs> I said, okay. And that was it. It was amazing. I mean, li that's literally what happened. That was the end of the day. They had nothing else to say. I don't know why, but anyway, so the point is the fact that you can't say what consciousness is or integrate it, but here's the simplest way of defining consciousness. Consciousness is the subjective experience of knowing. And I don't mean knowing as in terms of knowledge, it's a receptive awareness. It's the simplest way of defining it. And it has at least two things that can be differentiated from each other. Remember, integration is differentiation plus linkage. So, What did it say about sleep? Well, there's a lot you can say about sleep, but in sleep you're not in a form of the kind of consciousness we're talking about. You have a lot of information processing, for example, what happens in sleep is outside of consciousness. But that's a complicated thing because you can wake someone up in sleep and they're very aware of it, so they're not remembering what happens. That's a whole different thing. So in terms of being awake and consciousness, you have knowing and the known. You differentiate the knowing from the known. Like, for example, when I wave my hand, that's the known, but your sense of awareness of it is the knowing. So some of you have been to the Mindsight Institute and you've seen this uh, table in our office. And around the table, you have a wooden rim. And in the center, you have a glass center, okay? So I would bring people up from the couch or the chair and I'd say, look, let's try this experiment. If we're going to integrate consciousness, let's have a metaphor for consciousness where in the hub of this table, you've got the center that's the knowing, and on the rim, you have the known, right? And let's just see how this goes, where there are these things that hold up the table, they look like spokes of a, a wheel. In fact, nobody wanted to call it the table of awareness, so we called it the wheel of awareness. So we said, okay, imagine we're going to move this spoke around, and imagine on the rim, you tell me, what, what are the knowns you've got? In the first segment of the rim, you have your... How many of you have done the Wheel of Awareness practice? Let me just see. So you guys know, who, the, the ones who have done it. And you can do it from my website, drdansiegel.com. Go to resources and do it. So you have the first segment of your first five senses, what you see, hear, smell, taste, touch, brings in the outside world. Then you move the spoke over to the next segment of the rim. It's the interior of the body. In science, we call that the sixth sense. Interoception the feeling of your muscles and bones, your genitals, your intestines, your lungs, your heart. Then you move the spoke over to the third segment of the rim. It's your mental activities. We call that the seventh sense of feelings and thoughts and memories and hopes and dreams and longings and desires, beliefs and attitudes and intentions, all the stuff of mental activities. Then you move the spoke around to the fourth and final segment of the rim, which let's just call it the eighth sense, your sense of connection to other people, to pets, the planet, anything begins with the letter P, and, you know, things outside your body, basically. And then, as, as I was doing this, people started getting better. It was 
I mean, it was really exciting, right? You know, the people would get better. I mean, trauma would be alleviated. Mild to moderate depression would be alleviated. Anxieties would be alleviated. It was really quite striking. And for those of you who are my longtime students, you know, I don't ever like to tell anyone what to do. In fact, my kids often complain about that. They said, Dad, why aren't you telling us what to do? And I said, I will never tell you what to do. I, I will ask you to think about what you're doing, but I'm not going to tell you what to do. And they would say, tell us what to do. And I said, no, I'm not going to tell you what to do. The same thing is true with people I work with as fellow travelers, because to me, it's like the old biblical story. You really want to help a person learn to fish rather than give them a fish, that kind of thing. Anyway, so my students who are, who are um, therapists would say, tell us what to do. I said, I'm not going to tell you what to do. And they go, why are we coming to see you? I said, I don't know why you're coming to see me, actually. <laughs> they go, well, tell us what to do. I said, I won't tell you what to do. They go, okay, tell us what you do. I said, well, I'll tell you what I do, but I have no idea if it's going to work for you. It could be some peculiarity of the way I do it, and it has no universal application. They go, well, tell us. So I would tell them about the wheel. They started doing it, and their patients, their clients, started getting better. So then I thought, okay, well, that's kind of wild. So then I started doing it in workshops. And I would take my recorder with me, and I recorded it, and I did a sequence of 10,000 people doing the Wheel of Awareness. Some of you may have done it. Did any of you go to the Soul and Synapse at the Garrison Institute? Anybody go to that? So, you know, we, we did that together. So, basically, imagine Soul and Synapse done with 10,000 people recording it all the time. And amazingly, what happened was, no matter the person's background, no matter the person's um, education, their profession, their age, no matter what country it was in, if you listen, besides the accents and the translations, you wouldn't be able to tell where this person was. The findings were so universal. So in the mind book, you'll see, for the first time, a presentation of the results of the 10,000-person study. So here's what I want to tell you, just as a take-home point, and then we're going to open it up for discussion. When we did the wheel practice, we added one interesting twist to it, which was when people got done with the mental activities, instead of just moving to the fourth and final segment of the rim, we bent the spoke around or retracted the spoke so people could just experience awareness of awareness. And even though time doesn't exist for the sake of time, I'm not going to go through all the details of what they said, but here's basically what happened. People would say the following things. When I bent the spoke around, I got a feeling of eternity. I got a feeling of expansiveness, that I was much bigger than the body I'm in. I got a feeling of joy, incredible energy, of incredible potential, of God, of love, of this deep interconnection. Flow doesn't need any spatial aspects to it. Flow doesn't need time to exist. Flow can be the change, flow means change, in the position on the probability distribution curve. That's what energy flow means. It doesn't need any kind of spatial place. I know that's weird, but that's just the way it is. That's what energy flow means. So think about our graph. Here's what the 10,000-person study suggests. And this is what I presented to the quantum physicists I'm working with now. And they're very excited about it because it's consistent with quantum physics, but not said by quantum physics. So, for example, I presented it to Arthur Zions. And he's a quantum physicist who used to be the president of the Mind and Life Organization with the Dalai Lama. And he was five thumbs up excited about this proposal that goes like this. Thinking, emoting, and remembering as examples of mental processes are the actualization of possibilities into these higher levels on the probability distribution curve. Mood, intention, and belief are plateaus on the position on the probability curve, in midway, if you will. And here's the suggestion. The knowing of consciousness emerges when energy is at the near zero point of the plane of possibility. 
that consciousness comes from an energy position in what the physicists call a sea of potential. And this would be consistent with the 10,000 person study where when people have the experience, they drop into the sense of the infinite. Now, what I think is happening is that the sea of potential is a microstate. And what I mean by that is the only set of combinations to create infinite is one. It's a microstate. But once you rise above that position, you're creating macrostates that have specific combinations that contribute to them. So they have an arrow of time, a directionality of change, once you're on the rim of the wheel is the metaphor, but once you're above the plane. And so the answer to the question of why do we have these experiences of timelessness and time boundness of arrow free and arrow bound is because we have this experience of the knowing coming from a micro state of infinity and the knowns that arise from it that have this quality of the arrow of time, a directionality of change. Now in terms of the ethical culture society, and in terms of the mission of the Garrison Institute, and in terms of the Blue School, which is trying to inspire kids to hold on to their curiosity, to embrace uncertainty, and really allow themselves to see new combinations, what the Blue School is all about. When you think about the three hosts of tonight's evening, for me, the way it relates to our whole discussion of mind is this. You force a kid to focus only on standardized tests and you are telling them that the only thing that has value are these peaks of filling in these pencil circles in a standardized test. But if you look at the work of Ellen Langer on mindful learning, or Carol Dweck on the growth mindset, or Angela Duckworth looking at grit, <clears throat> my scientific interpretation of their beautiful works is that you're allowing people to value the uncertainty that rests in this plane of possibility. And from an ethical culture point of view, what you're doing is realizing that if we can offer people, children, adolescents, and adults, an opportunity to experience what it's like to live more from this plane of possibility, this source of awareness. Here's the amazing <coughs> thing. Your plane and 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 the plane that comes from this body are the same. We find unity through the plane of possibility. Now, that linkage is very important. And as we said, so is differentiation. So we have separate identities in these plateaus and peaks, and those are important. But if you believe that your plateau and peak is better than someone else's because they have different skin color or different ethnic background or different religion, and you are bound by your evolutionary history to have what you know is in-group, out-group distinctions where these bodies we live in survived because you could figure out who was from cave A that you could trust, who was from your other cave, cave B, that you're not a part of, that could kill you, and especially when you're threatened, what mortality say and studies show, is you will treat people from your cave, cave A, with more kindness and care, but if you've identified someone as a foreigner from cave B, you're more likely to treat them with hostility as subhuman. It explains the tendency the human species has for genocide. So we were just recently in Berlin, and Berlin is just one example of genocide around the planet, but the systematic destruction of certain people that were considered subhuman is something we humans do all around this planet. It's happening today. So an, <coughs> an awakened mind would be a mind that uses itself to overcome millions of years of evolutionary history 
which we can do with consciousness. See, this is why this discussion of mind is not an academic discussion. It's not just an intellectual exercise. I mean, it's interesting, I think, intellectually as a scientist. But as a human citizen on the planet, this becomes crucial because the only way we are going to transform the way we are treating each other or the way we're treating other species or the way the climate is deteriorating rapidly is by dropping into this plane of possibility, feeling the joy that comes from that, feeling the love that comes from that, feeling the energy that comes from that, feeling the source of possibility that comes from that, embracing, let's say at Blue School, embracing the uncertainty of it. It's where curiosity and creativity come from. And then allowing that to be our common home. What arises from this plane of possibility is the source of something called empathic joy. Where you see someone who's successful and you realize we are being successful. Instead, what do we do in high schools? What do we do in middle schools? We say, fight with your neighbor kid because only certain people are going to get into certain colleges, right? And you need to race to get into that middle school and race to get in that high school and race to get in that college so you race to get into that cemetery, right? <laughs> it's insane. I mean, literally, it's insane. And I was teaching in Princeton just uh, the other day at the public library there. And, you know, Albert Einstein says this view of our separate self is an optical delusion, not even an illusion, a psychotic belief. The human mind, riding on its brain history, has a sad vulnerability to believe it's separate. I was in a think tank with a bunch of quantum physicists recently, and the first talk that uh, one of the physicists presented, the first slide has the following sentence, I'll paraphrase it. Quantum physics has proven the interconnectivity of reality. The issue is what's wrong with the human brain that believes the world isn't? That is the issue. So when we see this aspect of the who, we can see that we construct a separate identity. But when you give people the opportunity, for example, to do this soul and synapse thing, do this wheel of awareness over and over again, they drop into this plane of possibility, and then they are a conduit that feels the deep interconnected nature. So that, for example, in this body, when I look out at all of you, I see all of us. Yes, we have a separate self that lives in a body for about 100 years. You want to take care of the body with good sleep. You want to feed the body well, exercise the body. You want to enjoy the body. That's the me that Jonathan was talking about. But we also have an identity that has been so undervalued in modern society, the we, that we are about to kill this planet. Because when all you live is as a me, if you think the mind is just brain activity or the self that comes from the mind is just coming from your head or coming from your body. What you do is you treat the planet like a trash can instead of an extension of the body, a part of the self. So this we issue that Jonathan was referring to is simply this. We need to have the future of our species. And this is the human age, as you can see from Diane Ackerman's book of that title. You know, this is the human age where we are shaping this planet more than ever. This is the time when we need an integrated identity. We need to allow people to acknowledge the differentiated me, but equally recognize, starting in homes where children are raised, to realize they are just as much a we as they are a me, and in schools to realize they are just as much a me as they are a we, where collaboration is emphasized rather than competing against each other. If they want to compete, let them compete with one of the world's problems so when they beat the competition, everybody benefits. There's enough problems going around this world to let competition be put it to work. So what would an integrated identity be in terms of the who question, right? We've addressed the when. I think we've done all the interrogatives. So here's what I want to suggest to you. Me is great. 
we is equally great. They're just distinct. You put them together and you get a we. And I know it's a funny word, but what's been fascinating about we as an identity, as simple as it is as a meme, as an idea, when I've taught in different countries now, people start getting excited. I was teaching in Rome recently, and they said, we've got an Italian we. I go, what would it be? They said, well, an Italian I is I, O, oh, yo, and me is noi, N-O-I. They said, so it's a palindrome, I, O, N, O, I, and they're so excited about it. And in Germany, they came up with another word. So what if we started a conversation which starts with where is your mind and allows us to explore what your language is of living the life of Mui. Because ultimately, if you find now, we'll get to the why and I'll, we'll open up for questions. If you say, well, why are we here? And this was something when I wrote it in the book, I was very nervous about it because it's kind of arrogant to say, this is why you're here. So it's really a question, is there a why of the mind? And the scientific answer is, if the mind is a self-organizing emergent property, then there is a why of the mind. You are here on this planet to integrate. You are here to differentiate and link. That's why you're here. And if you use this concept of integration that creates this flexible, adaptive, coherent, energized, and stable thing, which Jonathan was making a fun joke about, that was hilarious, Jonathan, um, then what you get when you allow integration to be what your life is about, what you get is kindness and compassion. You also get curiosity and innovation. You get a sense of joy in life. And what more can we ask from our lives than that? To create a kinder and more compassionate world. So let me bring the presentation part to a close and let's open it up for discussion. Thank you so much for your attention.